Hello, and welcome to World War II in the Pacific on Learning the Social Sciences. So to go over what has been happening uh, right before the outbreak of World War II, we have to go to Japanese expansionism or the imperialist Japanese empire and what they have done so far. Well, in 1910, they formally annexed Korea. And as a quick timeline, in September 1931, they invaded and conquered Manchuria. And they did this because they were desperate for raw materials. Now, oil they were getting from the United States, but Manchuria had the raw materials that they needed to continue their expansion. And on July 7th, 1937, Japan invaded China. However, if you want to go even farther back, you can find the roots to Japan's imperialistic nature. You could go all the way back to the Meiji Restoration. When the United States showed up with Matthew Perry in the 1800s, Japan then quickly saw what was going on in China and did not want that to happen to them. So they modernized their military, industry, and technology extremely fast. So fast that within 50 years, they were able to defeat China in a war and also Russia in a war. And that is also the time period when they took Korea. Now, this does not make Japan, though, a militaristic nation. They switched over to having a militaristic leadership during the Great Depression. Their country was hit hard, and they continually had restrictions placed on them with building their navy in other areas. And so the militaristic leadership took over and started to build up its military. They also look towards other countries for expansion, for resources, and for living space. Now, one of the chief orchestrators of this was an individual named Tojo. Tojo was uh, the chief of state of Japan's army in Manchuria in 1937. He attacked uh, or launched the attack versus China, and he also, in 1940, helped arrange that pact with Germany and Italy. In 1940, he became the Minister of War and continually went kind of head to head with the Prime Minister up until the Prime Minister of Japan stepped down. He then took on that role as well while still maintaining his military positions. Now, Japan sought to unite all of Asia under their flag, and Tojo was definitely pushing for that. With the French and British colonies sitting vulnerable because of the war in Europe and Hitler taking over all of these territories, Japan saw its opening. However, there was still one country in their way, and that was the United States. Now, if we go into China to kind of just step back a few years, the United States was closely monitoring the situation and, of course, was monitoring the Second Sino-Japanese War. Now, Japan was building what they called its Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. The war was not moving as fast as Japan wanted it to. They were losing momentum. Although Chiang Kai-shek was not doing a lot for offense, he did do an offensive strategy against Shanghai after they lost it, retaking it, but then they lost it again, and did a few offensive strikes in other locations, but mainly Chiang Kai-shek was on defense. However, Japan was not moving as fast as they wanted to. And so they switched over to using a lot of fear tactics to try to help push their empire building faster. So during the rape of Nanking, Japanese soldiers slaughtered at least 100,000 civilians and raped thousands of women in the Chinese capital between December 1937 and February 1938. The Japanese believed in racial purity and supremacy, and they treated the Chinese and Koreans brutally, assuming that they were kind of on the higher end of the pyramid. Now, with the rape of Nanking, this obviously drew attention from the United States and other nations as to what was going on. This was not kept secret. Japanese soldiers sent postcards home documenting what was going on and almost taking a sense of pride in what they had just done. So it was not a hidden event from the world. 
So with the United States watching what was going on, the negotiations were definitely getting more tense. The United States disapproved of the invasion of China, and the United States moved its fleet from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, so that we would have less ocean to cover if we would have to go, say, protect the Philippines from the Japanese. Now, the United States was the number one supplier of oil to Japan. And finally, in 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt cut off oil trade to Japan, putting them in a very tough position. Japan and the United States were having peace talks up until December 6, when the United States received a decoded message instructing the Japanese peace envoy to reject all proposals. And the United States knew right then and there that that meant war. However, the timing was unknown that it was going to be the next day. On December 7, 1941, the U.S. military base in Hawaii was attacked. Japan had been preparing to attack since November. They hoped to cripple the United States fleet so that the United States would not be able to fight back. The U.S. aircraft carriers, however, were out at sea when Japan attacked, which was a major blow to their entire attack. They wanted to sink all the carriers. That would have definitely diminished the ability for the United States to act or react in the Pacific. However, Luckily for the United States, the aircraft carriers were out at, sea, out at sea and safe. Japan also attacked Guam, Wake Island, Midway Island, the Philippines Islands the same day, and a lot of other locations the same day or within the month. Now, once the home front mobilized in the United States and hit high production, Japan truly did awaken a sleeping giant that could outproduce them in military arms and technology. So in looking at the attack at Pearl Harbor, the attack took less than two hours. 2,403 Americans were killed. 1,177 of those were killed aboard the USS Arizona, a battleship that was hit with a bomb that penetrated to one of the magazines or ammunition storage areas within the ship. And that launched a massive explosion. 23 sets of brothers were killed on the Arizona, along with a father and son who both served on the ship. And of course, being that this ship exploded so violently, it was a shock to everybody around when they saw that. Now, on top of the 2,000 American soldiers that were killed and civilians, we also had 1,178 wounded. 21 ships being damaged or sunk, 300 aircraft damaged or destroyed. This was definitely a devastating attack. With that, Franklin, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt pretty much summed it up with his speech, which stated that this would be a date which will live in infamy. And it certainly was. It is still commemorated today, December 7th, and you can go to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and go to the uh, memorial of the USS Arizona. And there are still uh, people who have chosen that even though they have lived an entire life uh, since the attack, that they uh, asked to have their remains interred there. And if they were a member of the USS Arizona but survived the attack at Pearl Harbor, then their wish was granted and uh, scuba divers would then take their ashes and bring it down to the ship to intern it there. The United States declared war officially on Japan on December 8, 1941. All members of Congress, except for one, Senator Rankin, voted in favor of the war. Now, Rankin was a pacifist and could not vote for any war. She also was the very first female member of Congress. Uh, she actually was in Congress before the federal government had actually given women the right to vote. However, her home state of Montana gave her the right to vote so she could serve in Congress. Now, nine other women were actually serving in Congress at the time, and they all voted for the war. Now, Rankin, after her vote uh, as a pacifist for not declaring war, uh, she had to hide in a telephone booth for a while until Capitol Police could help escort her out of the building safely. Later on that week, when the declaration of war for Germany and Italy came, she actually abstained from voting, so she would not have that um, incident happen again. 
Jumping to Japan, the Admiral, who was in charge of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto, studied in the United States and had extensive knowledge of U.S. military history. He was hesitant to go up against the United States, as quoted, I can run wild for six months. After that, I have no expectation of success. Also, after Pearl Harbor, he stated, a military man can scarcely pride himself on having smitten a sleeping enemy. It is more a matter of shame, simply for the one smitten. I would rather you made your appraisal after seeing what the enemy does, since it is certain that, angered and outraged, he will soon launch a determined counterattack. Yamamoto was correct in his assessment. So in the early months of the Pacific Theater, the Japanese attacked Burma, British-held Borneo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Wake Island, and the Philippines. Uh, in the Philippines, the United States had a um, obviously a force station there under the leadership of General MacArthur. And they fought valiantly against the Japanese forces. However, FDR saw the writing on the wall that they were going to lose it. They also were unable to send in enough reinforcements to help protect and build up the forces of the Philippines. And so they took General MacArthur out. Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually had to give the order himself to have MacArthur leave the island since he wanted to stay with his troops. However, fighting did continue until April of 1942, when finally the rest of the United States forces eventually had to surrender. And unfortunately for them, they then experienced one of the worst moments of the war from a soldier's perspective, and that is the Bataan Death March, which killed around 25,000 American and Filipino POWs as they had to march um, through mile after mile of tough terrain without given wa given water or food or resources, and many of them were executed for not keeping up and other various horror stories. Um, however, you one can see this quote as it will basically summarize the um, brutality of the death march and the um, the camp afterwards. Anyway, this is from Lieutenant John Spainhauer, who stated, I was questioned by a Japanese officer who found out that I had been in Philippine Scout Battalion. The Japanese hated the scouts. Anyway, they took me outside and I was forced to watch as they buried six of my scouts alive. They made the men dig their own graves and then had them kneel down in a pit. The guards hit them over the head with shovels to stun them and piled earth on top. In early 1942, the United States was able to hit Tokyo with bombers. They were able, under the direction of James Doolittle, to take, um, take and modify bombers so that they could take off from an aircraft carrier. Now, unfortunately, the aircraft carrier was spotted by a Japanese fishing vessel, and so they had to have the bombers take off early. However, they were able to fly to Tokyo and bomb the city, thus having a reaction to Pearl Harbor. Um, however, they then had fuel problems getting to their safe locations within China. Some people of the raid uh, were taken prisoner. One plane actually flew to the United Air to the USSR to try to find refuge there, knowing they couldn't make it to China, and they were taken prisoner there. However, the Doolittle raid was something that boosted the American morale and made Tokyo stunned. Now, the American forces also halted the Japanese advance in the South Pacific at the Battle of Coral Sea. The United States stopped a fleet carrying Japanese troops to New Guinea and also stopped their push to take Port Moresby. The minute they were successful at at least stopping their advance in this area, the Japanese thoughts of taking Australia at this point ended and they then started to think about other areas to launch an attack. And that would be what Yamamoto had been asking for quite some time, an attack on Midway Island, which is just a little bit to the north and to the west of Hawaii. Now, U.S. military intelligence knew an attack was coming against an American base somewhere, and we figured it was probably going to be Midway. And so we went on and put a message out there 
discussing something about Midway to see if the Japanese would forward it using kind of the same code language for this place that they were also going to attack. And bada bing, bada boom, they had a winner. It was Midway. And so we sent our carriers there for a major battle. Admiral Yamamoto wanted to capture Midway so that he could use it to attack Pearl Harbor again. Now, the Japanese, though, did not know that the United States was sending its carrier fleet up there. Now, they bombed uh, Midway and started their attack on the island. However, the United States planes launched off from the aircraft carriers like the Enterprise and hit the Japanese carriers. And the Japanese would eventually lose four aircraft carriers, which is an immense loss at this point in the war. They also lost their experienced pilots, which is something that they don't really ever come back from. And with this attack at Midway, the Japanese advance stops. And the U.S. now will eventually here go on offense with its island hopping strategy. With having attacks go on in the South Pacific and another one kind of taking a central yet still southern line going across. Now, in terms of Japan learning about Midway, they really didn't. News of the defeat was kept secret from the Japanese public as they did not want them to know that they had lost such a large amount at this battle by losing four carriers and all of those experienced pilots and planes. So just for a little look um, to know exactly where Midway is. It is the big blue mark here on the map. Hawaii is just a little bit away from there. And you can see why Yamamoto wanted to take that island because of its close proximity to Hawaii. So this has been part one of the Pacific Theater of War of World War II by Learning the Social Sciences. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Thank you and bye-bye.